This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khandam. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a really great show today. This is the unredacted Jess and Jamal analysis of the redacted Mueller, uh, Mueller investigation, which, as you know and we know, and hopefully most of our listening audience knows, was released today after some, gosh, we could say after some two years of uh, investigation by the special um, investigator Robert Mueller and his team. And and just to put it in context, today was the day that the report was released. It was described as having minor redactions. Minor? That Yeah, that, that's the way it was described. There, there was more black ink <laughs> than... Uh, Right, but Hint I'm just gonna, on it. yeah, but I'm just I'm just telling you what what people thought compared to what it could have been in terms of the redactions. Um, I think there's a couple of big picture things to say. For me, as we were because we're as part of the show today, we're going to do a deep dive. Right. I want to. The big picture is what we have basically, and this may be strong words, but we have a thug in the White House and we have a fixer. As Attorney General, well, let's just at least put this. Let me in, let me put it. Let, let me just okay, put it in and context, then, and I'll come back to you. Uh, okay, so but let, let me just say one sure. one quick thing, and then we'll get right to the specifics. The larger context that okay. I wanted to put it in is last week, Attorney General uh, Barr put out his four, or I don't know how many exact days ago, but last week sometime put out his four page memo, concluding and exonerating the President of the United States, from any collusion. The take-home message from the Mueller report today is that Robert Mueller, after two years, could not conclusively exonerate the President of the United States from a obstruction of justice. Mm -hmm. This is major news. I mean, this is basically, and we'll, we'll get into the weeds about how he got there, why he got there, why he couldn't indict. It's a long, complicated story. But basically what we have is the Attorney General of the United States acting as the President's personal attorney rather than the attorney for the United States of America and all Americans, basically mm -hmm. saying, you know, Trump is clear, he's been exonerated, there's no collusion. He's a victim. He's a victim. And Robert Mueller, the straight shooter, who's basically saying, you know, we cannot exonerate the President of the United States from the possibility that he committed obstruction of justice. So we're going to break it down today for all of you. On uh, That's right. So basically the Justice Department today released a redacted version, and I've looked through the whole script, Jess, of the special counsel Robert Mueller's report on whether Donald Trump's campaign colluded with Russian officials and whether the president obstructed justice, right? That's, that's kind of the, the basis of this whole that's the basis. report. So while the investigation did not find hard evidence, this is according to the report of collusion, the report detailed numerous instances in which Trump tried to interfere with the probe. So we looked at it. I mean, I don't know, from different angles, just there were issues, you know, about the obstruction, for example, of justice. You know, the from summer 2017, this is according to the report, through 2018, the president attempted to have Attorney General Sessions reverse his recusal, right. take control of the special counsel's investigation, and order an investigation of Hillary Clinton. So you have that part of, you know, right. the obstruction of justice. So, of course, Trump made no secret of his frustration that Sessions recused himself. Remember, right. all of a sudden, Sessions became the enemy, and he was like bashing him left and right, basically trying to, and which eventually led to his, uh, I would say, forced resignation. To his demise, to put it, uh, to put it mildly. So, so, so th th this uh, this was one of the uh, the main points. But let's let's keep in mind, Jamal. There is no law having to do with collusion. Collusion is a concept. And Robert Mueller in the report, and I know we both read it, maybe you know, we're, we're going to have to read it again in more detail, but Robert Mueller's mandate was not about collusion. 
it was about obstruction of justice. Collusion is this made-up term that Trump and his minions and his PR apparatus, including Rudy Giuliani, and now, sadly to say, part of his PR machine is the Attorney General of the United States of America, William Barr, have come out and said, no collusion, no collusion. But listen, man, it is not about collusion. What we're really talking about are two different facts here. There's plenty of evidence to suggest, not even suggest, but to prove that either through WikiLeaks, through Roger Stone, through Guccifer 2.0, through the IRS, the Internet Research uh, Service that the Russians were, were, were kind of engaging with the 2016 uh, election, and members of the Trump team at the highest levels. You know, Paul Manafort uh, is sitting in jail right now, Jamal, because of various activities having to do with his engagement with, you know, uh, uh, Russian cutouts. But the collusion issue is not really what it's at the heart of the nature of the beast here and the nature of the investigation. It's whether or not Donald Trump, as president of the United States, attempted to obstruct a legitimate investigation into potential illegal activities. And here's what we know. He fired uh, Comey, the FBI director, and he told Lester Holt, you know, this Russia thing, I was thinking about it. Comey, it's all made up. That's why I got rid of Comey. That is an attempt to obstruct uh, an investigation in into wrongdoings. That is almost the definition of obstruction of justice. He got rid of Jeff Sessions, his attorney general. He did all these other things. We now know from the Mueller report, Jamal, that he instructed people within his staff to lie, to not tell or to misstate the truth. What, I mean, they're, they're, they're spinning it basically to lie in terms of what they were supposed to say to Robert Mueller. Well, there is a big gap here when it comes to the, um, I would say, the uh, scenario with Sessions, because Sessions after said after leaving the Justice Department that he had no regrets about recusing himself from the right. Russia investigation. Right. And we have evidence citing notes and testimony describes Trump becoming irate at the news that the special counsel would take over the investigation after the attorney general oh, he was enraged. Sessions recused himself. He was enraged. So he was re uh, enraged, in fact. He publicly humiliated Sessions. Well, also now we have something that he said. Uh, this is uh, President Donald Trump. He broke down upon learning of the special counsel and, and said, I am effed. I am effed. According to the newly released report from Robert Mueller's investigation, right, he thought that his presidency was in jeopardy at the time, right, and and that was going and to be he, the end of his presidency. And really, what the investigation is about, Jamal, it's really about once Donald Trump said, "I am effed," it's whether or not he took steps using his authority as president of the United States to interfere with a uh, Department of Justice special counsel investigation of wrongdoing. Did he, in fact, direct people not to be forthright? Did he attempt to thwart the investigation? Did he uh, use his executive power to undermine the investigation? And I think the interesting thing in reading, you know, again, it just came out. It's over 400 pages. It looks like there's compelling evidence that Trump took multiple steps to obstruct justice, did multiple things to interfere with the investigation that Robert Mueller was doing. And so when I said at the beginning we have a thug in the White House, what I, what I really am trying to imply here is that this is the way uh, gangsters act. You know, when, when they want to dissemble, they want to not tell the truth, they want to reconstruct and hide evidence. They do, I mean, this, I mean, we saw bits and pieces of it for the last two years, Jamal, and, and uh, you lived in New York for a while. You knew about Donald Trump's, you know, um, legendary, <laughs> endless and legendary attempts to avoid taxes, to do illegal things, 
to pay off mistresses. I mean, all of these things. And when we put all of the pieces together and we look at what happened in 2015 into 2016 and everything that he did from 2016 onwards to interfere with and try to hide and lie and obstruct justice, it's it's very compelling. It is. I want to uh, fast forward a little bit and then we'll come back because I want our listeners to pay attention to the last paragraph of this redacted uh, report, Mueller's okay. report, which is basically the conclusion of it. Yes. And this is what, because, you know, you hear this and that, I just want to use what Mueller himself put it for everyone to see. And, and I feel uh, the media is ignoring that part. And then we'll go back to what the media has been ignoring. And which is the Israel connection. Yeah, we have to I, talk I, about that. I will talk about that. And then because this is now, before we, we have been talking about this, but now we have it on paper. Luckily, it wasn't redacted, or at least most of it, it wasn't. But in the conclusion, this is what, in, in Mueller's own words, because we determined not to make a traditional prosecutorial judgment, we did not draw ultimate conclusions about the president's conduct. The evidence we obtained about the president's actions and intent presents difficult issues that would need to be resolved if we were making a traditional prosecutor judgment. Yeah. At the same time, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state based on the facts and the applicable legal standards, we are unable to reach that judgment. Exactly. Accordingly, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. And that's the most important That's sentence. exactly right. And this is where it shows you that Trump keeps lying, keeps saying, no, no collusion, I'm it's exonerated, about, yeah. I'm 100% in the clear. clear. Right. And it's in black and white. It tells right. you that right. you know this report does not exonerate him. And so he left an opening for Congress to basically dig deeper and well, which they should do and they should do but that's pre- that that's precisely my point Jamal that's 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 really precisely the point um, the the Mueller report and the unredacted uh, Jess and Jamal report basically is unable to conclude that he did not commit obstruction of justice he cannot unequivocally be exonerated as Robert Mueller said, you just repeat, you just read it verbatim. If we could have exonerated him, we would have. If the evidence was compelling that he did not commit obstruction of justice, we would have exonerated him. They couldn't, Jamal. Mm-hmm. The evidence was compelling. The evidence was overwhelming. He did it. We say this, you know, hiding in plain sight. Donald Trump is a how should we say this? He, he has no filter, right? So he was obstructing justice, Jamal, in plain sight. He was tweeting. He was speaking. He was saying all these things to the, the, the White House uh, attorney, Don McGahn. He was saying it to Hope Hicks. He was saying it to Sean Spicer. He was saying it to Rentz Priebus. He, he was saying it to everybody, Jamal. He was telling people... We, you know, basically don't admit to the special counsel that I said X, Y, and Z. That's instruction to lie and to obstruct justice. Now, of course, A.G. Bill Barr, William Barr, is a he's shilling for the president. He's he is he's a shill. He he has really, um, and I. And, and I can't believe, as the head of the Department of Justice, he should he, act neutral. That's that's the that's, that's the, minimum. the minimum is to, is to be representative and ab- uphold the law, uphold the law, uphold the Constitution, be the representative of the Justice Department. And yet, what he did instead was basically, this is the sleight of hand, Jamal. There's no collusion, but it wasn't about collusion. We keep having to remind our listeners, that this is not about collusion when it comes to the Department of Justice. It's about did he obstruct. And if he obstructed Jamal, that's a crime. Now, we will have to get into the weeds a little bit. So I want to take us now a little bit to the the least reported story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I want to say something. Even though, because even though we're, we're going into the weeds and whatever, I don't think that the... 
Democratic Party should be obsessed with this report. I don't think so. I don't think because this is what's going on. I don't think that they should kind of uh, use this report as their mantle for their campaign. If they do, they will lose. I already think they're going to lose. Because there are, there are a lot of other <laughs> issues. But it seems like, you know, I see this obsession. Uh, and, and, and also, oh, it makes me sick watching the analysis uh, on CNN, and, and especially on CNN, by the way. They're kind of uh, betting, you know, the bank on this one. And it's, it's not a mistake. It's, it's a big mistake. And they're ignoring the important stuff that I want to know about. Other members of this society want to know about. It's not the Russian collusion is deeper than just hacking into it's much deeper. Uh, Hillary Clinton's email and other stuff. But, for example, I, I take us back and, and there's somebody in jail take, taking you back to the contacts with and through Michael Flynn, right? So for our listeners who don't remember or they have forgotten about Michael Flynn, Michael you, Flynn you was should. the incoming national security advisor at the time and was the transitions team's primary conduit for communications with the Russian ambassador and dealt with Russia on two sensitive matters during the transition period. What, what were the two issues, Jamal? So, one, a United Nations Security Council vote and the Russian government's reaction to the United States' imposition of sanctions for Russian interference in the 2016 elections. That's one, one, one issue. And the second? And then, but, uh, and, and, and this is a reminder, we have to remind people, the United Nations vote on Israeli settlements. Ah, Israeli settlements. Yeah, and now we're talking about the transition team. We're talking about the incoming national security advisor for the president-elect Donald Trump. And we're talking that this was happening during the administration of Barack Obama. Yeah. So we still had the president. We had Barack Obama. They're conducting business. We had a secretary of state. We had a secretary of state. So on December 21st, uh, 2016. Before it, he's president. Egypt submitted a resolution to the United Nations Security Council calling on Israel to cease settlement activities in Palestinian territory. The Security Council, which uh, includes Russia, was scheduled to vote on the resolution the following day. So there was major speculation. And, and if you if, if taking everybody back to, to that time, uh, President Barack Obama was very irate with Benjamin Netanyahu. And he wanted to send a message. And and his own Secretary of State, John, Kerry, John, John Kerry, Kerry right. just had it. He, he has been going back and forth, and he made a very stinging statement saying, you know, like, Benjamin Netanyahu is playing games, he's, he's not talking about peace, blah, 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 and they wanted to send a message, right? So there were very credible and these at the time were speculation in the media that the Obama administration would not oppose a resolution. That's right. So this would be one of the very, very few times when the United States uh, just uh, would basically abstain from vetoing a resolution which is critical of Israel, which is saying that they has they have, they must for the I don't know the optim time, saying that they must cease and des desist from uh, building new settlements. So, so according to Flynn, the transition team regarded the vote as a significant issue. And on December twenty second, two thousand sixteen, not himself only, with, along with the several members of his team, transition team, uh, they communi communicated with, with a foreign government against, a, 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 you know. And On it, foreign is, policy. Yeah, they communicated with a foreign government. They had no business to do so. None. So they communicated with foreign government officials to determine their views on the resolution and to rally support to delay the vote or defeat the resolution. So what they were asking the Russians at the time, and this is all done at the behest of Israel. This is now Donald Trump and Flynn are acting as agents of the Israeli government against a sitting president and a sitting administration. Unbelievable. And, and they, they, they said, listen, you have to help us out, you know. Delay the vote. Either delay the vote until Donald Trump takes office because we're going to veto it. 
or vo- or actually use your veto power. So imagine it would have been incredible that for the very first time the United States abstains from issuing a veto on behalf of Israel, and then you'll see Russia <laughs> taking that position to right. use its veto power. This is what they wanted from the Russians. And this is all documented. Or force, you know, they were asking, you know, or force, talk to your contacts within the Sisi government in Egypt, asking them to on their pull, own to, to postpone, yeah, right. to exactly to postpone the vote. And then on December 23rd, 2016, Malaysia, New Zealand, Senegal, and Venezuela resub- resubmitted the resolution. So, so there was a feeling, there was a sense that this game was going on. So, so more supporters came to the rescue to make sure that this resolution died. Uh, no, no. At the time, these are the ones who were trying because they knew that something like to, you know, that it might die. That right. let's let's resubmit it. So throughout. The day, members of the transition team continue to talk with foreign leaders about the resolution, with Flynn continuing to lead the outreach with the Russian government through Kislyak, that's the Russian ambassador. ambassador. When, when Flynn again spoke with Kislyak, Kislyak in front informed Flynn that if the resolution came to a vote, Russia would not vote against it. The resolution later passed 14 to 0. First time with the United States abstaining. So, I mean, it's not only just like a, uh, you know, any resolution. You had the entire world supporting the resolution, every single member, and a delay of that resolution would have killed it or a veto by the United States, which it had uh, abstained. So they were trying to circumvent the Obama administration. No, I, I think what you said before, Jamal, is actually more important. What you said before is is really important for our listeners to understand. We're, we're talking about Donald Trump, not president-elect, not even in office yet, and Michael Flynn, also part of a transition team, acting on behalf of the foreign interests of another country, acting on behalf of the foreign interests of the government of Israel, not the government of the United States, who had just elected Donald Trump, but acting on behalf of the foreign interests of another country. That smells really bad. It, it smells bad, it looks bad, and frankly, Jamal, it is bad. And that by itself, in terms of investigating, you know, in more detail, if the Congress can prove its mettle as a co-equal branch of government, uh, they need to look at this. Now, unfortunately, you and I both know that the Congress, the likelihood of Congress being able to exercise its co-equal branch um, authority, they're not going to touch the question of Israel. So we we can rest assured that the analysis of this whole thing with with Kislyak, with uh, Flynn and Trump around the veto of the UN resolution is not going to happen. Well, if they don't touch it, at least the media should be talking about it. Well, the media won't this be is, talking this about is, it. This is front no. and center within the report. This was, uh, uh, I, I would say, some people uh, said this was treason. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this I, is this I, I is some think... some of the big charges that you have now. Uh, an incoming administration, uh, you know, conspiring with uh, a non-friendly state, right, like Russia, to basically circumvent well, the current administration. Right. How do you describe this? Yeah, that's. I'm not ready to use that word yet. I mean, people have been using that word. Other people have been using that word, whether and they were coordinating with Russian. I mean, the reality is, Jamal, that if you as a citizen, a non-elected citizen, engage in that kind of foreign diplomacy, it's it's not considered, uh, I mean, it's considered outside the bounds of normal functioning, obviously. But as you said, some people, including myself, would consider it illegal. Whether or not it rises to the level of treason is a very good question. But let's not forget, they were doing this on behalf of Israel, Jamal. They were not doing it on behalf. I mean, you swear an oath to the Constitution of the United States to uphold the values, the traditions, the laws of the United States, and you have the audacity before you get into office to act in the strategic interests of another country, 
to be to to get in the way of the foreign policy of the current sitting president of the United States. That's really bad. I mean, that by itself um, deserves a, an entirely new investigation. Now, the Congress won't do it, Jamal. Well, we if we have time later on, we may get to that. But this Congress won't do it. By the way, you're listening to KPOO in San Francisco at 89.5 FM. We're streaming live on, live on Facebook Live, Jamal Dejani 2, where you can watch us live. We're streaming on KPO.com. And um, we're, this is the unredacted Jamal, the unredac- unredacted Jess and Jamal analysis of the redacted Mueller report. I, 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 I kind of feel like we need to get into the weeds of one more thing. I don't know. It's it ha- it's kind of a level of detail. I'm just going to throw it out there. So Mueller says, I'm not basically I'm paraphrasing this. I didn't approach the obstruction of justice as a typical prosecutor. Mm-hmm. Because I know there's this OLC Office of Legal Counsel memo that says you can't indict a sitting president. So hanging over the head of Robert Mueller, he's saying to himself, huh, I see all this evidence for obstruction of justice. However, the Department of Justice says in their, you know, in their memoranda that uh, you can't indict a sitting president. So that is the basis, Jamal, for why Robert Mueller did not issue an indictment against the president of the United States. That's why... Three things. That's why he didn't indict it, indict him. Two, that's why he didn't exonerate him. And then number three, Jamal, that's why William Barr, Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump are jumping and doing somersaults all over the place saying, hey, we're free. We didn't. There's no collusion. So because Robert Mueller is one of these straight arrows, Jamal, he follows the letter of the law. He said, because I can't indict a sitting president, um, I'm not going to issue an indictment. But the evidence is pretty compelling here that obstruction of justice, you know, acts did occur. But and as a result, we can't exonerate him. This, to me, is the huge um, bombshell from today. You know, he can't be exonerated. It also, I think. William Barr is going to go down in history as one of the most despicable attorney generals. We've had uh, we've had some really weak attorney generals. Uh, what was uh, Bush's first attorney general, Gonzalez? He was he was a disaster because he was just so weak. But at least he tried to follow the Constitution. What we have in William Barr is basically the personal attorney of the United uh, of the President of the United States, who has let down the entire Department of Justice, I believe uh, basically thumbed his nose or gave his middle finger to the Constitution. And, and I basically think where we're headed now, Jamal, I think we're headed for a constitutional crisis. So I want to shift gear a little bit because uh, we have limited time. Oh, yeah, we have a lot and, to talk and, about. And stuff. things that is still, uh, of course, connected to this topic uh, while we're talking about the Trump administration. So, uh, buried in this commotion, yeah, yeah, uh, discussing just uh, focusing on the Mueller's report, uh, President Trump's, and I would say maybe Kushner's, and Bibi Netanyahu's long-awaited proposal, the peace plan for achieving peace in the Middle East, will not be released until June at the earliest. This is according. Well, that's interesting. To the White House and uh, and senior advisor, uh, I mean, to the president and and son-in-law, Jared Kushner. He told yesterday. This was a small story yesterday. He told uh, members of the media in a. Uh, and told actually ambassadors, they said they wanted to wait till after Ramadan. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, it's it's it's. They too wanted di- to wait till it, after Ramadan. Too, now that, too, that, dis- too, dis- too disruptive now because, as you know, Ramadan is around the corner. I think it starts May six, May fifth, May fifth or six. So when they were asked what's going on, okay, now you've been talking about uh, about this uh, deal of the century for the past two years and you keep postponing it, 
first they postponed it till till uh, um, end of the year and then till June and then I don't know what. And now, what's going on? And then they said we want to wait till after Ramadan. So Jamal, so, I, so I, which I, means I have never felt so utterly disgusted by an by a political analysis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just gonna give you some quotes. You know, at okay. least use their words. So, so according You're wait till according Ramadan. to okay. Kushner, he encouraged the ambassadors, and this is according to his own words to to keep an open mind about the peace negotiations, which he ha- which basically have been touted since early in Trump's presidency, if our listeners recall, as potentially leading to the deal of the century. The deal of the century, Jamal. So uh, Kushner is leading the peace land, guess with who? With the special envoy, Jason Greenblatt. Jason Greenblatt. Who just a couple of days ago bragged uh, on Twitter and put a picture of the new map of Israel, which includes the Golan Heights. He said the, the State Department now has reissued the, the map of Israel, and it no longer refers to the Golan Heights as uh, occupied or disputed, but it's part and parcel of Israel, the State of Israel. Okay, Jamal. So... Uh- so, so, so this is this is according. I mean, so these are the player, the, the, at least the players. You know, of course, the okay. Trump's deal of the century, Jared Kushner's peace plan, and you have Jason Greenblatt, who's kind of conducting okay. I, all I, the negotiations. I have some breaking news for you. So let me just say a little bit. So, so the proposal release, of course, they said, will come after the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, which ends in early June. Also, but also to allow the re-elected Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to form a governing uh, coalition. Okay. I have a couple of pieces of breaking news for you and some breaking news about the Kushner-Netanyahu-Trump deal of the century. It was leaked this week that one of the central foundations of the deal of the century, the deal of the century to finally bring peace to Palestine in the Middle East, the, the final deal does not include the creation of an pal- independent Palestinian state. So, wow, Jamal, that, so we're talking about 71 years of occupation, 71 years of stolen Palestinian land, 71 years of like apartheid practices, and Jared Kushner and his brilliance as a Harvard grad, um, finally was able to create a peace plan where there is no Palestine, Jamal, that there is no independent Palestinian state for the indigenous people of historic Palestine. This is, to put it mildly, um, and we know, by the way, uh, it's a disaster. It's a joke. It's never going to fly. And we also know that the Palestinians have not signed off on it. So Jared Kushner, in his brilliance with Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump, have created a peace plan among three parties with only two, two of the parties on board. Sounds like a bit of a disaster to me. Well, during, actually, to your point, during his remarks, and uh, Kushner reportedly disputed the idea that the peace initiative would focus mostly on an, an econom- economic package to help the Palestinians strengthen their economy. Because that's what everyone has uh, has been saying, that forget exactly what you're saying. They're not going to be talking about land and uh, rights. rights and whatever. It's just we're going to give the Palestinians some money so they can focus on their economy. So the slaves can then uh, buy yeah, at the slave And then the slave just a reminder, store. the United States has cut all uh, foreign aid to Palestine, and right. so they've been struggling to kind of pay, pay uh, you know, their salaries. Uh, salaries they haven't been and able so to forth. pay salaries. So they said, no, 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 that's not, that's not, that's not the whole story. Insisting it would contain a very detailed political component. He did not reveal, though, whether the plan would call for the establishment of an independent Palestinian state on areas captured by Israel during the Six Day War in 1967 and formally annexed in 1981. So when asked, when he pushed to say, okay, so 
what's the end result aside from the uh, economic financial aid and economic uh, would that lead to the two state solution for Palestinians to establish an independent state he avoided to answer that question because i'll tell you why he avoided it jamal because there won't be an independent palestinian state this kushner peace plan is a kushner destruction plan it's an attempt to uh, further erode the possibility of not just a two-state solution, Jamal, but further erode the possibility of any kind of solution involving justice, the indivisibility of justice, refugees, land integrity, uh, to undo the seven-plus decades of wrong that has been dropped upon the indigenous people of Palestine's heads for these seven decades. It's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute uh, insult to the intelligence of anybody and it's an absolute uh, in uh, it's an absolute disaster. I should say that the EU, in anticipation of knowing some of these things, Jamal, has already come out before Kushner has announced the plan and completely panned it, completely criticized it. Because they know something <laughs> most people don't know. They all already they know, know what's happening. They already know the details. And just to add to the story, just David Friedman, the U.S. ambassador to Israel, said. Uh, this is back in January that the proposal would be presented within several months. National Security Advisor John Bolton, you could see all the players, right? How much they love peace and how much they are looking after the interests of Palestinians. Yeah. Jared Kushner, <laughs> David Friedman, David Friedman, and John now Bolton. John Bolton said last week that the administration would roll out its plan in the very near future. So if Palestinians, and this is a message to the Palestinian Authority and yes. the Palestinians, I hope they if they're to going to put their lives in the hand of John Bolton, <laughs> just think about it. Just think about it. These are the people who are deciding the future of the Palestinians. Yeah. John Bolton, Jared David Co Friedman, and, and Jared, Jared Kushner, Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, um, Donald Trump. Yeah, I'm not sure... That Look, I mean, I mean, usually the deck is stacked, but it's not a hundred percent stacked. No, uh, uh, Jamal, this is look at every name, and I'm gonna repeat it once more. From top down, Donald Trump, Jared Kushner, John Bolton, because I think he plays a, 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 a yeah he does stronger role than David Friedman and Jason Greenblatt. Right, these guys. Are really worried they, about they, they love Palestinians. Justice. They love justice in Palestine. Exactly, yeah. and they're going to bring you the deal of the century. I say to them, to the to the Palestinian leadership, and to all Palestinians, to stop smoking, whatever the, you're smoking, whatever you're smoking, stop smoking the argila, and and pay attention <laughs> to the names of the people who are deciding your future. So I want to say that that's a good analysis, Jamal. I just want to say a couple of things about that. Number one, um, so what they're, I mean, it's no one, no one, no one believes that they're delaying this uh, to honor. Uh, Ramadan and, and the Eid afterwards. No one believes it. What we do believe, however, uh, and I think we discussed this a little earlier before the show, the more likely scenario is that Benjamin Netanyahu is on the ropes. He's been unable to form a coalition government to get the parliament going. He will be indicted, as I predicted at the beginning of the year. And it's unclear whether or not he will be able to strike a deal to avoid indictments and form a parliament before June. So the real reason, there's two reasons. The real reasons why they don't want to rule it out now, they don't know if Benjamin Netanyahu will be around, number one. And two, I believe, it's two more months to squeeze Abu Mazen economically. Well, I don't, I don't know if there is anything left to squeeze. <laughs> but they've tried, I think, the setback and why you're seeing the delay, Jess, because the setback has been the multiple trips and discussions by Kushner and Friedman and others, including also uh, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. Pompeo going to Saudi Arabia, trying to force the Saudis to accept this deal. And till recently, if you remember, the king of Saudi Arabia said, no, we will not, you know, basically give up the right to Jerusalem for having Palestinian. 
we still support the two-state solution. Da, da, da. No annexation. To, in, they did not accept the annexation of uh, the Golan Heights. So their plan to put the pressure, especially, it was a very good time because of all the troubles that MBS was facing. In the Arab world. So in exchange, this was the deal, like maybe we'll, we'll kind of help you you know, get rid of all the troubles of Saudi Arabia and the scrutiny it has been facing. We just want you to kind of go along with that deal of the century, which does not involve the creation of a Palestinian state, but rather than an economical package and maintaining the state status quo and the annexation of, of settlements. the settlements to Israel. So, so what this that, was this is this yeah, is coming. This yeah, will be that, coming. That, that's the that's the peace plan. Let me just say, if you want to understand the Kushner, a Friedman, uh, Netanyahu peace plan, it, think of think about it as a plantation with Bantu stands, and think about allowing the slaves to earn a little money from their slavery so that they can use the money that they're earning from slavery, Jamal, to go to the master's store and buy goods. That's, that's in a nutshell, that's the Kushner peace plan. So what they've been doing for the last two years is squeezing all of the aid. USAID has cut their uh, packages, their, their, their programs of uh, supporting Palestinian NGOs. They've, they've cut it, and I think even this week was there's a big announcement that this huge aid patch project from USAID, they closed a bunch of their offices in the West Bank. Um, secondly, we know that uh, UNRWA and the United Nations, that money that the United States has always supported for Palestinian refugees living in the West Bank and Gaza, that money has been cut back dramatically. So even though I think you're right, there's nothing left to squeeze economically, that's not going to stop them from trying to squeeze Abu Mazen even more. So, uh, like I, I repeat what I've said before, you know, stop smoking the argila <laughs> and pay attention to... Quit smoking the argila. You know, there is no intention in that peace plan. It's basically more land to, for Israel. Right. And, and it's that's legitimizing about it. the occupation. It is, just like what happened uh, to the Golan Heights. We have a few minutes again left, and we want to... I talk to about our last topic, which is really the issue with Representative Ilhan Omar. Oh, listen, man, we have to talk about this, Jamal. The attacks the continue, the hate mongering, and basically the, the death incitement threats. The death threats. to violence, uh, uh, basically. Which, so, yeah, which I want to say a few things about that really quick. So uh, Donald Trump posted this video on Twitter, It got rep and it basically shows... Uh, the Twin Towers after the attacks in 9-11. And it, it, it's an attack on uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. It basically calls her ungrateful. The ungrateful immigrant, Jamal, that trope is coming out. She's dangerous and she's being disrespectful to the 9-11, uh, the memory of 9-11. The, the, they had, you know, they had to arrest somebody who made death threats, but the number of death threats that have come against Ilhan Omar in the last week since Donald Trump, the president of the United States, unleashed this vicious, hateful, Islamophobic attack on well, Ilhan Omar. Well, I mean, let's, let, you, you call them incitement. I mean, that's... that's it that's, is it, incitement. He's inciting it's, to violence. It's, it's incitement to criminal behavior. Right. But, you know, I expect the president to do that. What I'm really disturbed about, Jamal... And I'll, I'll have to be very frank with, with this statement. I, I think that the Democratic elite and the Democratic leadership, you know, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, Nadler, Schiff, all of these guys have done a grave disservice to Ilhan Omar for not defending her more. Uh, you see these articles leaking in the Hill and in the kind of Beltway press talking about how Ilhan Omar is toxic for the Democrats. You're seeing little whisper campaigns against her. You have a woman of color. You have a refugee. You have a Muslim woman who is being viciously attacked. This is the Trump playbook, Jamal. I'm going to find someone that we can rally around to hate. And it happens to be a black Muslim refugee woman from Somalia. It is absolutely disgusting that the Democratic Party has not 
come to her defense. Now, Rashida Tlaib has come to her defense. AOC has. Ayanna Presley has. Tulsi Gabbard has. I mean, the progressive women in the Congress have come to defend her. But where is the rest of the Democratic Party, Jamal? They've left her out without any support. And I'm afraid that there, there is a silver lining here. Oh, really? Show and, me. And no, she, there is actually what's there's the silver lining. A silver she's having lining. death threats. Uh, she's having death threats. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, most of the, uh, I guess, the leadership of the Democratic Party threw her under the bus multiple times. But she has actually raised eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, that's not enough. Since, well, it's not enough. But for her little campaign, people are donating in small. Uh, small donations, and but in numbers. Yeah. So which which is really important. Yeah. Because she's gonna come under vicious attack during the next primaries. Yeah. And not even during elections, but during the next primaries. But they've already. But they've already tried to. Pri- they're. Vo- they will definitely primary her, which means there are the the elite of the Democratic Party have already lined up people to run against. An incumbent, Jamal. Yeah, but the most important thing is to be ready, is to have the support. And we know how uh, financial support is very important. So so the fact that you have, uh, she has managed to, to raise almost a million dollars just in a very short period of time. Yeah, but I, 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 I have to say, I find it unconscionable. I mean, you know... You know Nancy Pelosi coming out and saying I'm the mo- I'm I'm progressive. How can you be progressive when you have a an African Muslim uh, refugee woman who's a congresswoman who you are throwing under the bus at this time when she needs as much support politically, economically, and uh, you know physically she needs support. I mean she has to have. Security details. Well, they've increased the the security. Nancy Pelosi has uh, actually ordered, uh, you know, it's disgusting. I guess uh, upgrading her security uh, detail from the uh, Congress police. But Jamal, how is this just not flat out part of the Trump playbook? And I will say the Trump and the pro-Israel playbook. I mean, can we be honest for a minute? Why are they attacking Ilhan Omar? Is it because she's black? Well, there's lots of black Congress men and women, but that's part of it. Is it because she's a Muslim? Probably that's a part of it. A but big ca- part of it. Yeah, a big part of it. But isn't the real reason that they're attacking her so viciously is because she's been the only one with such a clear, unequivocal voice calling out the apartheid practices of the government of Israel and saying, let's have an honest discussion about U.S. foreign policy. Isn't that the real reason? Well, I would say it is the real reason, but you've you've said most of the reasons. And she kind of, all these people who are full of hate, all these bigots, she is their nightmare, their, their ultimate nightmare, she, woman, black, refugee, Muslim, but you forgot one other thing. Smart. Uh, outspoken. And then the other thing is she's a hijabi Muslim. She also wears the hijab. That is their ultimate nightmare yeah. and brings the worst out of them. And this is what's going on. So if you want to know what the Trump play, if you want to know what the Trump playbook is, if you want to know what the Republican playbook is for 2020, it's going to be a picture of the Twin Towers coming down next to Ilhan Omar and saying, ungrateful, ingrateful immigrants and refugees, this is why we have to build the border, this is why we have to have the Muslim ban, and this is, and this is why it's such a scary time and why we must elect Donald Trump again. And I'm sorry to say this on Arab Talk Today, Jamal. I said this is one of my predictions. There is a really good chance, unless the Democrats get their act together, that Donald Trump could win And I again. don't see them getting their act together. No, because they're going to attack Donald Trump instead of coming up and speak to what people of the United States really want to hear about. They want a plan for how to fix the awesome problems that we're confront that are confronting us right now. Do you know that I mean we don't have that much time, but 
Let's talk about Trump having a trillion dollar tax break to the wealthiest people and wealthiest corporations in the world and cutting the tax deductions for most middle class and most Americans for like home mortgage deductions, you know, uh, well, I'm, property taxes. I'm sure ev- uh, most people from the middle class and, of course, from the they're working getting class. Le- they're getting less tax deductions. They're getting, they're getting no less refunds. refunds. No exactly, refunds. Jamal. Less refunds. And so let's, let's talk about that reality. What are you going to do about that? Well, that's why, that's why I, I'll start. I'll repeat what I've started the show with. If the Democrats are going to just focus on the Mueller report. They're going to lose. And if they're not going to talk about real issues. They're going to lose. Taxes. You know. Health care. Health care. Even the economy because he just puts this false image that everybody is doing hunky-dory. And by the way, the big thing is when he came or during his election campaign, he promised to to stop the national debt, it has been accelerating. At a tremendous the, the rate. trillions of dollars have been mounting. Those are the real issues that they should be talking about. All right. Well, thank you for listening to us again today. You've been listening to Arab Talk with Justin Jamal on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Send us your comments to Arab Talk at KPO.com. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook. Check our website, ArabTalkRadio.com. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing, and we'll see you next week.